So thank you very much for these uh, very great talks. Uh, so yeah, I, I really liked uh, that it's uh, that it's illustrating well that uh, that diversity is actually not necessarily uh, translating into inclusion. So it was in the title of your your talk, but I think it was also um, uh, so. Uh, what, well, what we saw uh, with you, uh, Rawan, that uh, well, children have like uh, th probably the same similar type of education in some countries, but it's still not uh, necessarily inclusive. And it's also something that we saw in the um, uh, the talk of, uh, of uh, David, where uh, there is diversity in the media, but it's not necessarily uh, inclusive. And so, um, so yeah, I think you, um, one, yeah, one thing maybe to, to start the discussion is about um, whether there are some, one gender is more stereotyped than the other, and uh, should we like, uh, try to tend into like, is the, the, the male, uh, uh, well, not phenotype, but uh, a behavior, the one that uh, female should try to, to reach, or, uh, or is it the opposite, or the more stereotyped, like for instance for the children? I don't know if this was something that you were uh, seeing uh, about their self-stereotype, uh, or? <laughs> so, um, I don't know whether one gender is more stereotyped than the other, is that what you're asking? No? Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, the, the thing is that uh, in my work what, and in other work, what, we, what is clear is that the stereotypes um, of for, for boys and the cultural stereotypes generally uh, match. Whether for girls, there is this double constraint. There is this, uh, they, they, for example, for uh, leadership and assertiveness, uh, they hear two opposite uh, messages from society. Uh, be assertive, because that's cool, but do not be assertive because you're a girl. So they have to, you know, uh, play with these two messages, whether for girls, for boys, it's like a highway for them to, you know, to, everything is coherent. Um, does that answer the question? No. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was wondering if the stereotypes are, are like really shared, or I, I, I don't even know if you, <laughs> you have the answer, but uh, if it's really something that is shared uh, like in your situation throughout all the participants, or if it's affecting more like actually one gender than the other, and that it could explain the differences that you, that you see. Mm. But, uh, okay. I think that in, in what we uh, studied, um, I think and I think it fits with the uh, literature that it's not just men that they are um, biased or have stereotypes. It's everybody. We, I'm as biased and as as any other man here. And so I I would really like to avoid, you know, like the blaming game. Whose fault it is? It's not anybody's fault. It's the, for the benefit of everybody to do better. And uh, so men suffer from the other side, from the flip side of the stereotype. And there are men who don't. Um, necessarily behave naturally in this very assertive, uh, aggressive uh, uh, behavior that is uh, associated with a male stereotype. As much as women need to be different than their stereotype in order to match um, what the workplace uh, uh, demands. So I think diversity is good. We need to allow maybe get liberated from this very binary um, labels and stereotypes and allow everybody to behave with, as they they are and allow everybody to express their their own uniqueness in, in these uh, um, situations at work or in, in other um, frames. And um, the question is how to do that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And for David, yeah, I don't know if we see David. Can he see us? So for him, it wasn't... Uh, so yeah, I can hear you. Ah, yes. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was wondering, so in, in your case, it wasn't clear who is actually making the decisions about uh, having this uh, um, <coughs> like representation of men and women that is uh, skewed in either of uh, either more faces or more uh, <laughs> speaking. And uh, do you have a, like an idea about that? Uh, the reason why we see more or less speech or faces? Yes, yeah, so who is kind of taking these decisions uh, about uh, this representation? 
Is oh. it something that you, you know? Oh. Why or or it's something you don't have access to that information? Yeah, so why I, I did take the decision of using uh, these descriptors? That's uh, the question. No, it was rather like wh why this kind of uh, representation is. Uh, 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 do you have I would say <laughs> yeah, it's quite uh, empirical. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, basically, for, for the speech time, uh, it was used uh, in previous uh, manual studies. So basically, the Riser and Grazi uh, public report, uh, which was uh, done in 2008, so they measured the speech time of men and women, uh, but only for very low amount of TV and radio content. It was from uh, six minutes, six minutes per channel, to uh, to three hour max per channel, uh, because uh, it's very costly to obtain uh, manually. Uh, so I would say this decision is uh, has uh, made sense even uh, from a manual analysis perspective. Just uh, currently uh, with uh, French uh, elections, uh, there are also estimation of the speech time of the candidates. So basically, I, I would say uh, for the speech time, it's uh, it's empirical and also coherent with uh, manual uh, studies. For the visual time, uh, I'm not aware of studies measuring the visual time uh, on um, on uh, TV. Uh, I'm aware of uh, global media monitoring uh, project, which uh, when uh, measuring uh, gender biases on the press, they count the amount of pictures of men and women. And, uh, I hope uh, this answer partly to your question. Uh, yeah, yeah. So then maybe we can open to to Zoom or the, the room questions. So I guess I can, yeah. I can yeah. go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I will pose my first question to Rawan. Uh, so are there, in your experiments with children, uh, are there any risks of observer bias? Like the children respond uh, to what they think that the experiment wants to hear. Uh, if you were um, equally distributed in gender for uh, for the experimenters, for example, or can you control for this? Yes, we we do control for this. In what I showed you, uh, the third experiment was done by uh, male and female experimenters, and the second two. Uh, in the first, we did not uh, control uh, for that. Uh, but uh, in our project, we always control for the for the gender of experimenter, and even uh, there's a study now where the experimenter will be present, but also the the person asking the question won't be the experimenter, but but a Martian, so someone who oh. comes from, <laughs> 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 so that you can you know try to to uh, of course there's uh, this this risk of. Uh, Children telling the experimenter different things uh, depending on uh, on their gender. Yeah. yeah. Uh, since this uh, session was dedicated to <coughs> gender bias and real life, and that. And since we are living these uh, fatal days of, <coughs> of a war at our borders, I cannot prevent myself to uh, pay tribute, tribute to uh, Virginia Woolf and the, her book, Three Guineas. I don't know, I discovered this book very recently. I knew that she... Uh, wrote a book, uh, Three Guineas, but I never read it. And I discovered that it was written in 36 and translated only in 76 in French and never was translated again. And why this, I quote this book, I mentioned this book, is because uh, she wrote this book as an answer to a male colleague who contacted her in 36 for helping him to uh, fight to prevent the war. 
And she took the, her time to think about her potential support and finally decided to answer no and produced this book with a terrible description of the patriarchal system in uh, her country and where she explains that uh, the best uh, effort she can make to prevent the war is to fight with her own arms, uh, a weapon, against patriarchs. So this is all what I wanted to say and to my contribution to your session. I dream from a potential uh, discussion between Margaret Atwood and Virginia Woolf, but maybe you <laughs> can set up that by Zoom. Unless you're stuck with us. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you. I didn't know about this book. I know Orlando, which is also very interesting for gender, uh, <laughs> by Virginia Woolf as well. But uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, yeah, for telling that. And, uh, yeah, there is another question. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. They were all very, very interesting. I had a question relating to cultural differences because I thought it was very interesting to see that there were similar prevalences of gender bias in the three countries that you tested. And I know that Norway is seen as a very progressive country, especially in terms of equality between women and men. Um, so I was wondering if you had any idea on how a country like Norway may be adapted from the gender biases that were seen in the six-year-olds to this kind of progressive society that we see at a later stage. Um, I would speculate, I don't know, I don't know Norwegian society at all, but I would speculate that things like uh, relations um, are really persistent to, to societal change. Maybe when, I, as I showed you, children uh, very early on detect power, power relations on really subtle cues, so children who are four years old have already four years old of life behind them where they observe uh, people interact and they have this capacity to detect uh, power cues. So maybe they, Norway maybe is not that different, did not, um, ha had made a lot of ex advances, but uh, hierarchy is still visible in the level of interpersonal relations. So this is my speculation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will go for a question for David. Uh, is there any data on the viewership or listeners uh, of the TV and radio programs? Uh, if this is influenced by the gender of the, of the people represented in the, in the screen or in the air? So there, there are some data. Basically, the audience data in France it can be uh, estimated by, uh, by a company called uh, Mediametry. Uh, and they provide audience statistics for mostly all channels. The fact is that uh, it's much more detailed for TV than for radio. And it depends on, uh, on the channels. So for, for the, the, the most important channel, you will get very uh, detailed statistics. And for uh, low audience uh, radio station, you may have uh, a single estimation once a year, uh, in good case. So I would say uh, it's, uh, uh, you may have such statistics, but with uh, imbalanced uh, precision. So that's the reason why uh, I didn't use such uh, stuff in my studies. Uh, there, there are a few ideas, for instance, when I, uh, there are some uh, TV channels which target female audiences, such as Sherry uh, Van Sank or uh, Teva. Uh, from uh, my previous uh, studies, in those channels targeted to female audiences, then you got uh, something like 50-50. You got 50% uh, of women, 50% of male. You could have expected 80% uh, of women in a woman targeted uh, channel, but basically it's 50-50. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hoping it answers your question. Thank you. 
Uh, so I also have a question for David. Uh, so as in academic journals, there should be also a prestige assigned to the different channels, either radio or TV, uh, that you presented. Did you observe any, uh, you know, gender bias uh, according to the prestige of these uh, radio or TV channels? Um, basically, uh, uh, I no. The, the thing I did is uh, I audience time slot. Uh, I had uh, I never used data uh, corresponding to the prestige of the channel, and uh, sometimes you you may have the audience, the yearly audience of the channel, which may also vary every year. But uh, right now I don't know any structured and centralized database providing the prestige values of each uh, channel. So if you know such database, I would be very happy to use it. Uh, but currently, when I'm trying to estimate what you call prestige or the global audience of the channel, uh, I, uh, I look at press articles telling uh, this year, this month, this channel uh, had 10% uh, of audience parts. So basically, I don't know about a structured and centralized database providing prestige metrics for each channel over the years. Do, and uh, that's the reason why, why I did not use it uh, right now. Well, maybe to uh, be more precise, uh, just, you know, the, the frequency at which these, uh, like uh, France Inter is uh, listened to a lot, but then I know the other French channels very much in detail, but something more local is like less yeah. listened to. Just if you take the number of the audience as a proxy, for example, instead of yeah. prestige. Yeah, so I, as I told you, the, um, yeah, so, so you're talking about France Inter. I have uh, good news that I didn't present it today, but uh, that uh, so uh, this year France Inter um, became the, the radio station with the biggest amount of women uh, speech. So it's new from this year. Last year it was Europe. Huh? And, uh, from, uh, and this was uh, seen as a very good news since France Inter is also the most uh, listened radio station. So in the current world, you got the biggest um, equality, speech time equality, on the most uh, listened radio station. I, can, I think I can provide you the exact uh, number. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that was uh, one of the main results uh, we show uh, in this year's uh, in this year Arcom uh, report. Uh, 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 no, uh, I think we cannot show slides. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe uh, I can. Um, yeah. You can send it to um, Christian. Yeah, so I, I can if we. Ah, no. okay. Yeah, so basically, <laughs> for, uh, for, for the group uh, Radio France, uh, we observed the biggest improvement of women speech percentage. And now, France Inter has a 43% of female uh, speech. And that's the biggest amount of female speech in the generalist uh, uh, radio station of France. Hoping uh, this answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, also, do we have time for like one last question or? Yeah. We can, I think yeah. we can go for one last. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering how, um, if Elif, so did they learn about your study uh, and how did they react? Well, oh, so they, yeah, so they were very, very supportive at all stages. Um, and after we put it on bioarchives, uh, bioarchive, they contacted, contacted us and wanted to hear um, what are our thoughts and, and uh, recommendations and 
it was a very pleasant interaction. They took it very seriously and they tried to incorporate it into their pipeline and test it and see if it makes any changes. So, so what what will they do? Like uh, I don't did know. They, did I, they we, tell you like some? I don't some know. We will have a follow. It's very yeah. recent. Everything okay. is very recent. We need to th give them time <laughs> to process things as well. But uh, I, I think they're in good faith and they really try to do uh, better. Of course, there is resistance everywhere. I mean. It's difficult to tell to to accept that you are not uh, doing everything correctly, and you might be uh, biased or need to improve the way you you, you do science because you are not objective. This is uh, something that hurts scientific ears uh, to hear that your your decisions are are not really just based on data and and science. So. Uh, but they're really open and I, I really wish everybody in the publishing and other journals, if there are editors somewhere listening, <laughs> then uh, take this into account. Okay, thank you. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.